Hi everybody, my name is Darcy Lynn Deal, and I'm the owner and creator of Lippy Girl Makeup, and I'm here today to start a new series on my YouTube channel called Cosmetic Chemistry 101. And this series is a direct response to me going to things like beauty nights and fairs and conventions and also being an everyday conversation. And once somebody finds out that I have a background in chemistry and I'm a chemistry teacher, um, they, kind of, they, they come with all these questions. Um, about ingredients and studies and there's a lot of scares out there in the cosmetic industry that they want clarified and there's a lot of information out there and oftentimes it's conflicting or confusing um, and there's no one to make sense of that for for anybody so that's what this series is all about and um, I was going to start this series with a topic which was what is parabens and I thought I'd take a step back from that and do a broader um, video first because as I was preparing the information I was going to put in that video, I thought, you know what, I should take a step back and do an even broader topic, which is what is organic and what does organic mean? Because there's a couple definitions of organic and they are oftentimes conflicting and confusing. And so I thought I'd make sense of that and then move into later videos like what is a paraben, what's hydrogenation, um, what's polybutene. And so I'm starting today with the topic of ba -ba -da -ba, uh, what's organic chemistry um, and what's organic in the cosmetic industry or consumer industry. So I'll start with the definition of what's organic in terms of chemistry. And um, in the chemistry world, we divide the world of chemistry into two big realms. And those two realms are inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is the study of compounds that are based on one element, and that element is carbon. So they're carbon-based compounds. And inorganic chemistry is the chemistry of everything else. <laughs> so if you've ever seen the periodic table, if you zoom in on carbon and take it out of the periodic table, everything else left on the periodic table is considered inorganic. And then compounds based on that one element, carbon, is called organic chemistry. And even though it sounds like inorganic chemistry must be like a huge section of chemistry and organic chemistry such a small sector because these are all the elements and this is just based on one element, um, it's actually quite the opposite. Organic chemistry is a huge sector and actually a growing sector of chemistry um, because it is so important. Um, all organisms are based on on organic chemistry. We're all proteins and sugars and carbohydrates and nucleic acids, which are all carbon compounds, but also um, hormones and enzymes and things like that are also uh, proteins and fats and things that are carbon-based. And so the drug and medicine industry, the cosmetic industry, um, agriculture, it's all based on organic chemistry. And so, of course, it's a huge sector of chemistry. And if you need any proof that carbon chemistry um, has just a million different variations, um, you just have to look at the variety of organisms in the world because we are all carbon-based chemistry and look at all the different varieties of people and plants and animals. Um, so obviously organic chemistry is vast and changing and um, interesting. Um, before I move on to the definition of what chemistry, I mean, organic means in the cosmetic world or in the consumer world, I first want to just kind of teach you the basics of organic chemistry, which is nomenclature, um, so that maybe you can make sense of a couple of the words on your ingredient lists um, that maybe just sound big and scary. Um, and just because of the naming system we use in organic chemistry sometimes, it can, be, it can seem that way. So I'm going to teach you um, our counting system in organic chemistry, which actually will clarify a lot. Um, there's meth, which means one, eth, which means two, prope, three, bute, four, pent, five, hex, six, het, seven, oct, eight, n known, nine, and dec, ten. And so those are prefixes we put onto uh, organic chemistry compounds, which basically let you know how many carbons are in that compound. Um, and then the postfix or the ending of that word generally tell you what family that compound's in. Um, so um, you've heard these compounds, I know. Um, for instance, methane, um, propane, um, ethanol, 
and those prefixes tell you how many carbons in their compound are and then the postfix or the end of the word tells you the family. So methane is part of an, a family we call alkanes and ethanol, which is the alcohol that you find in alcoholic beverages, um, has two carbons and it's in the family of alcohols. Um, so ethanol tells you that it's in the family of alcohols and it has two carbons. Um, and so actually, as we move on in the Cosmetic Chemistry 101 series, that's um, a lot of the decoding of the ingredient list involves um, just that very simple nomenclature of, of numbers. And the other kind of prefix I just want to make sure you guys know is called poly. And uh, anything that has the term poly uh, as a prefix means that it's gone through a chemical process called a, polymerase, a polymerization. Oh my gosh, it's a tongue twister even for a chemistry teacher. Look at this. Polymerization reaction in which we take short-chained carbons like butene, which only has four carbons, and make them long, long, long chains of carbons, um, basically by linking them all together. And that's polybutene, long, long chains of butene. It's uh, what that literally means. And so a lot of things that make organic chemistry sound scary and intimidating is on purpose. Us chemists really like to feel smarter than the general population. And so, of course, we have our own naming system and our own little uh, wording. Um, it makes us feel superior to the general population. <laughs> if you were to take a chemistry course and they were going to be starting organic chemistry, they would spend the first few lectures, actually, just going over our nomenclature and how we name things. <laughs> because we do use different terms and different words than we do in general language. So let's move into kind of like more important organic um, definition because um, how is the word organic applied then to the consumer world? Um, and because I'm Lippy Girl Makeup, obviously I'm going to concentrate on its definition in the cosmetic world. So the definition of organic in the consumer world um, basically, although there's lots of standards, if you look up the standards, and I'm going to put the link in the links in the box below to things like USDA certified organic standards and Canadian organic standards, um, and it'll look like it goes on forever. There's basically two basic standards that are universal, no matter what standard you're looking at for organic, and that is. Um, that the growth of that organism involved no genetically modification, no genetically modification, no genetic modifications or GMO. <laughs> I can't talk. I'm sorry. Uh, so genetic modifications, and the other is that it was grown without pesticides. Um, so what is genetic modification? Um, there's a couple of uh, main types of genetic uh, modifications, and the first is splicing. Um, and so what is splicing? It's kind of neat uh, in the science part of like point of view and kind of scary in another point of view. Um, at the, at, when I teach splicing in my biology 12 classes, I'm always, it's fascinating. It's really interesting that we can do this um, and also very scary that we do this regularly. <laughs> um, so what splicing is, is we take a specific gene from the genome of one organism that has totally separately evolved from another organism and glue it into the genome of another organism. And um, so here are some things that we have done in the past and one of the most common examples I can think of is one of the first genetic modifications that we did which was, and I say we as in the general, I've never done this, um, as a general science community, um, but um, for instance fish live in very cold water often and they never freeze and um, that's because most fish that live in these arctic waters and these cold waters produce um, an antifreeze molecule and that prevents their flesh from freezing even if they're in sub freezing waters they won't freeze and um, t a plant tomatoes is very 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 susceptible to frost and so they thought hmm um, well fish have this gene that makes them produce an antifreeze so they don't freeze. Tomatoes don't have that gene and we lose a lot of tomatoes to frost. So what if we take the gene from this fish and glue this fish gene into this tomato? And so they did that and it made tomatoes um, 
the, the tomatoes with that that gene a lot more resistant to frost and uh, as a scientist I think that is very interesting and as a person I think that's kind of scary um, and the reason it scares me is because I also know that humans, we make modifications to things with basically one goal in mind. So in agriculture, um, a lot of the genetic modification that is done is done with one goal. And that one goal is to increase the yield of produce. Um, so when you're just, when you're just evolving um, a, an organism with one goal in mind, it's it causes problems a lot of the time um so because when things evolve in nature and in natural and in naturally in ecosystems they evolve their whole genome very slowly evolves um with very holistic survival kind of um goal in mind and when humans modify things we are looking for one thing we're looking for output <laughs> and it causes problems and I'll, I'll end this video with an example that concerns me the most um, pesticides is a little bit easier to um, is a little bit easier to describe so pesticides are when they dump chemicals on a, um, agricultural products to make them more resistant to bugs and weeds and things that are complicating when you're farming um, and so I will now give you an example of genetic modification and pesticides that um, concerns me and that is um, the ev evolution of a soy plant that is resistant to a weed killer called Roundup and what they've done is basically evolved a soy seed to be resistant to a uh, pesticide called uh, Roundup, and the reason why that's favorable, I guess, in terms of produce or production in a farm, is um, you can have these soy fields and just dump Roundup all over these fields and kill all the weeds, but the soy plants are resistant to the Roundup and so still survive. And um, so that's an example of genetic modification and pesticides. And the reason that scares me is because. Uh, they now found that even when they extract the soy and then make products with the soy, that they're still finding traces of Roundup in these products. And then there's um, a whole bunch of links with the Roundup to things like infertility and a whole bunch of other disorders. And so that scares me. And so I always make sure that I do pick organic produce or products because I, I like to avoid GMOs and also pesticides. Um, even as a scientist and a chemist who can respect how interesting the science is behind um, behind these um, processes, um, as a human being, as a person, they also scare me because um, I don't think they're necessary and I would rather play, pay a little bit more for my produce and my products and not have genetically modified products or things that were grown with pesticides. And so that's why Lippy Girl Makeup, when we use uh, oils and waxes and plant products, we make sure that we get certified organic ingredients um, so that we do not have GMOs and pesticides in our ingredients. So that's our first entry today. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit long. I wanted to be shorter, but I'm so chatty. I'm sorry. Um, if you have any questions, please comment below and I will reply and I can either make another video or I can um, answer them in my blog. And I'm also going to write the information that I said today in the video in a blog and I'll link that in the, the information bar below. So thanks so much for listening today. And um, please subscribe to my channel if you want to hear more Cosmetic Chemistry 101. And uh, thank you. Bye.